Hi, I'm Casey. I'm the founder of At Peace Parents, and I've helped hundreds of parents raising pathologically demand avoidant children and teens to get unstuck, stabilize their family, and find peace on their unique parenting journey. Today, I want to share with you guys something I haven't shared before outside of my programs, which is a huge mindset shift and a, and a tool that will support you to get unstuck with sticky things like screens, siblings, school, boundaries, violence, and other areas where you're focusing on trying to find a solution. And we're going to start talking about decisions. Okay, so for today, we're going to focus on five things how the PDA brain works, how that leads to a unique logic of decision making for us as parents and introduces the ultimate catch 22, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. We're going to be making a mindset shift, switching from focusing on trying to find fixes or solutions in the moment to decisions. I'm going to briefly walk through a specific example involving siblings because it's one of the topics that comes up most frequently and that I've experienced myself with, as a mom of a, of a PDA child with a sibling. And then I'm going to illustrate how that brings us to more clarity and moves us towards radical acceptance with the firm belief that the first step towards transcending limits in the long term is first accepting those limits and what you cannot control. Okay, let's start with how the PDA brain works. The PDA brain works in a unique way, and there's a lot of overlap with a traumatized brain. However, pathological demand avoidance or pervasive drive for autonomy, if you prefer that terminology, is a neurotype, meaning that an individual is born with that brain, okay? So what's unique about the PDA brain is that the limbic system and in the limbic system, the amygdala, exists and that's the threat detector it's always scanning the environment for is this safe is this dangerous or is this life-threatening when it detects danger or life threat in any situation all of us as humans have our nervous system react in a way that is not controlled by our conscious mind it is subconscious and automatic, right? It may go into fight or flight, which is what you're seeing with your child, the aggression or violence towards you or a sibling. It might go into freeze or even collapse or shut down. But the key point here is that this is not under your child or your teen's control, okay? It's subconscious. What's unique about PDA is that the neuroception of threat or that subconscious detection before the cognitive awareness that comes from here has to do with a unique root cause. What's unique about the pathologically demand avoidant brain is that anytime there's a perception of a loss of autonomy, freedom and choice, or equality, then this part of the brain will tell the nervous system, hey, you're in danger or you're gonna die, right? So this has a lot to do with introducing the ultimate catch-22 for us as parents, which is the realization that because of how the PDA brain works, we are always making the decision between activating our child or accommodating our child. What do I mean by that? We see our 10-year-old PDA child destroying the things of their younger sibling who's five. And we go over and we say, hey, you can't do that, right? As a normal parent, typical parent would say. That statement is perceived by this part of the brain as threat because it's a loss of autonomy and I'm putting myself in a position of authority above my PDA child. So I need to stop the destruction of the Lego tower but when I try and do that, as a parent would, there is an increased escalation and a fixation on doing the thing that I've said not to do. This is how the brain works, okay? So this introduces the ultimate catch-22. And this is why you feel like no matter what you do, you're in a situation where your child is escalating. Maybe you're removing 
the sibling if they're being targeted physically, but then your PDA child comes after you or fixates on trying to get to the sibling. Okay, this is equalizing behavior, meaning it's the nervous system reaction of trying to get back to a place of safety, and it's driven by the subconscious, this part of the brain. So what we need to understand is that when your child in the moment is in that moment of violence or aggression, if you try and focus on stopping their behavior or set boundaries, it will activate even more the threat response. This doesn't mean we don't ever set boundaries. This doesn't mean we don't ever take action or make mindful decisions. But where parents get stuck is this third point that I'm gonna make here for you. And it's gonna be triggering. And it would have been and has been for me as a mother. But it is the realization that in the moment when your child's nervous system is activated and completely they are perceiving the lion in front of them, even if it, there is no objective lion. We can't stop behavior because it's not conscious and it's not motivated behavior. It is survival behavior. So once this has happened, once you're in the moment, all we have are decisions, okay? What we do in response. And that's really triggering because most parents I don't know the <laughs> calculation, but in my mind, 99.9% .9 of parents that I've encountered are able to set a boundary and the child complies. And there isn't a cost to the nervous system if that happens, but that's not the case for us as parents of PDA children and teens. So how do we operationalize decisions? How do we make decisions in this really catch 22 situation? I've designed a simple tool that sounds fancier than it is that is called cost benefit decision making within constraints. So if you're walk or if you're listening to this and you're thinking like you might be thinking Casey what are you talking about this is too complex or you might be like great I'm an economist this is going to work great for me. But for both of you we're going to use this unique tool in a different way because what it's going to give us is clarity on what we can control and what we can't control. And it's gonna facilitate radical acceptance, excuse me, radical acceptance of our constraints. So what is cost benefit decision making? How do we use it? We take a single decision or choice point. Let's say we're talking about this example with siblings, where I see my 10 year old PDA child who's hovering around the five-year-old child and starting to quote accidentally knock over his stuff and I say hey don't do that and then he starts destroying it even more and saying it's an accident and then maybe I go over there and he hits me okay I'm in a moment of cost benefit decision making and there are three components to that one constraints there's a single constraint that all of us share if we are parenting children or teens who are pathologically demand avoidant because of how their brain works. That is, we only get to decide between taking action that will activate their nervous system further or accommodate it and de-escalate it, okay? That's the single constraint we all share. So we wanna identify and accept that. The second, the second set of constraints, and if you're watching this, an exercise might be take out a piece of paper, you can do it later, and just write down your unique constraints, okay? So what do I mean by constraints? Constraints are the things that you can't change in the moment. So if I'm in the moment with my son, and I'm a single mom, and I don't have a lot of money for caregiving, and I live in a city, in a, ge in a geographic area where there's not a lot of support and I'm also in an apartment and if my child runs out the front door there's traffic and a lot of people and it's not as safe as if I'm in a rural area okay these are constraints even if over time you could move you could get married you could make different decisions on certain elements 
Some of them you could change, some of them that you can't. These are constraints and they're unique to you. Everyone's constraints will be different, right? It could be your geographic location, your finances, your family setup, how many siblings there are, whether or not you're working full time, whether or not you're neurodivergent. These are constants that we really just can't change in the moment. And we wanna just see them as neutral, right? Just like, okay, these are my constraints. This is what they are. Then we wanna look at the cost benefit of our decision through the lens of our child, our PDA child. If I, maybe I have three options. If I move to stop the PDA child by putting myself physically between my younger son and him, there will be more activation because he will perceive a loss of autonomy and equality where I'm putting myself above him and it might escalate temporarily his activation. There will be a cost to his nervous system and potentially a trust cost because he doesn't have that felt safety. But then I wanna to turn to the next part of the cost benefit, which is my cost benefit as a human and a mother and my son's, my other son's cost benefit. So the first would be, okay, if I put myself between me and my PDA son and the sibling, the cost to me is I might be the recipient of getting hit or having Legos thrown at me. The benefit is that I might feel like a better mother because I'm protecting my younger son. Then I look at the cost benefit for my younger son. The cost to him of me moving my body between them might be that he hears more screaming or more escalation from his brother, but there's a benefit, a net benefit where I'm protecting him and his safety, okay? So that's one scenario. So it's not all benefit, all cost for anybody. It's complex and messy and we're trying to make sense of it with this tool. Let's look at the other scenario. Maybe I make the decision to take the younger sibling with me to another room to protect him from the violence. Well, often what happens is that the PDA child goes into further fight flight because the neuroception is one of increasing threat from me taking away the sibling and making the decision. And there may be more of an escalation. So we see that there is a cost to the PDA or his nervous system and a cost to our trust. However, and there may be a cost to my nervous system if my PDA son comes after me, or, but there may be a benefit of me and my identity as a mom keeping the other child safe. And then there will be a net benefit to the non-PDA sibling, okay? The third option is to not intervene and not set a boundary. A boundary is what you do in response to a situation, not trying to control what someone else does because really we can't do that. So the third scenario is I don't do anything. I sit there and I might be like, oh, I don't like what you're doing. There might be a little cost to the nervous system of the PDA child because I said something, but there's probably a net benefit to their nervous system because they have autonomy and equality and they get to keep messing up their siblings Legos but and there might be a benefit to my nervous system of not having to activate by setting a boundary because I don't want to listen to screaming or have him come after me but then I have to look at the cost benefit of the sibling right and it's a net cost to the sibling to be in the line of physical violence and destruction these are the three options all of them suck okay all of them are shitty, none of them are ideal. And this is the point. <laughs> so many parents, myself included, spend years trying to find, in this case, an option D and get stuck. All of their energy, frustration, rage, anger, myself included, goes towards trying to find what's the solution? What can I say or do that will make this not happen? Maybe if I use declarative language, or maybe if I crouch down, maybe if I say it in a certain way. 
But if we're stuck on the solutions in the moment of activation, mm -hmm. we're negating how the brain works and we're not radically accepting what the constraints are that we face as parents. Okay, so when I work through this tool in my signature program, parents gain absolute clarity and feel intense grief and sometimes rage and resentment that comes out and occasionally is directed at me. And that's okay, because that means you are starting to radically accept the constraints of your life. The largest one being what you can't change, which is how the brain works. Sometimes parents revisit other constraints in their life, like their job, geographic location, their finances. Sometimes they don't. But I want you to know, if you can't find a magical option D or a solution, it's not, it's not that you're not resourceful, creative, and intelligent. It's that that doesn't exist. And I wanted to do this present, presentation and teaching so that you have this tool moving forward that you can start implementing. So remember three things. What are your constraints that are unique to you, including your child's brain as a constraint? What's the cost benefit for your PDA child of any decision? And then what's the cost benefit to the family system? And then we can see clearly our options. And sometimes that's where we stay and feel the feelings when we have clarity around the decisions, but it will move us towards radical acceptance. There's two more things I wanna add. When we're talking about radical acceptance of our constraints and what we can't change in the moment, in the intensely present moment, it feels grievy and terrible. It doesn't feel good, it doesn't feel zen. However, what it starts to do is it reallocates your energy and focus away from searching for solutions that don't exist. And it frees up energy for you to start finding your own creativity, agency, and resourcefulness within the constraints because there is agency in your choices, okay? Or, as I mentioned, it may put on a different lens for how you view some of the constraints in your life that seemed immovable or static. The second thing I wanna say is even though this feels like giving up, it's not because it shifts the energy that your child neuro sets around wanting it to be different and wanting their brain to work a different way. And if the primary thing that sets off their nervous system is our agenda and our expectations and trying to teach them and change their behavior, then the more we can radically accept the aspects of them that we can't change, the more that they will feel safety and things will start to shift with them. It's very paradoxical. This does not mean that all our different decisions about accommodating them and supporting them and shifting the energy isn't over time going to bring down that cumulative nervous system activation, which leads to really intense situations with siblings. But it's a long term process and accommodations don't work to fix in the moment. They are a practice that shifts how we are with our children and lowers the overall perception of threat to create a window where they can actually be in their thinking brain and when they do activate, not tip over into the amount of violence that we're talking about here.